Welcome to And All Shall Be Well. I'm your host, Megan Rohr. And in this time in between the end of Christmas and a new year, I wanted to bring you a conversation about wellness that doesn't assume that you're going to be taking on some sort of fitness regimen, doesn't assume you're going to, you know, solidify some sort of romantic relationship like a lot of the advertisements and and other things on social media might be encouraging you to do instead this conversation with pam rocker is one that acknowledges that there are ways in which we are failed and flawed and want to be better and that we have been harmed by folk who haven't welcomed the fullness of who we are in the world in communal spaces and workspaces and other things like that. Pam is someone who actively works with individuals and congregations and helps them to live out their best practices into the world. And in our conversation today, Pam talks a lot about how we can enter some of these conversations, but also not need to take ourselves so seriously that we have to be perfect or saints in order to navigate those spaces. This is not a conversation that you have to be a part of a faith community to connect with. Uh, Pam is someone who is actively out there in the world and has shifted geographies and shifted uh, positions of how they are in the world and um, has changed up their family of choice and ways that they react with with their families of biology. And so this is just a conversation that is about how can you be someone who changes? And as you change, find ways to be loving and supportive in the world. And you might be surprised to learn that for Pam, those answers aren't always the kindness of human beings, but the love of the four-legged ones and the pets around you. I've been thinking a lot during this time about how we get stuck a little bit when we're trying to figure out who's right or who's wrong in big conversations, or when we're trying to figure out what's the path towards peace, or um, even depending upon the type of family you're in, like how we should spend our budget when there are only a certain amount of resources that exist. And I think this conversation today is one that encourages people to do the best they can with the amount of resources they have and to find love and strength and support in every space that it comes to you. So my name is Pam Rocker and I've been thinking a lot about introductions and sort of who, who I am and my brother, he's uh, he's this strange, colorful Texan dude. And something that he said to me, um, I think a couple of years ago, is he was thinking, you know, all, about the different labels he has as like husband, dad, you know, expert in X, Y, Z. And one of the things that he said is, you know, how much it's sort of changed his his perspective when he can say now that he's a grandfather and how that's changed sort of how he thinks about the future and the kind of world we want. And, you know, just how these different labels that do change in our fluid through our our lives influence what we prioritize. And so, you know, normally I would say, you know, I'm an atypical activist. I'm a consultant, I'm a speaker, award-winning writer, and yes, all of those things I'm very proud of and I work very hard for. One thing that's changed for me is uh, several years ago, I became a parent to two teen boys uh, because I married my wife and she had these two great kids. And that part of my life changing that I always had sort of dreamed of, but had never happened. And, you know, being a queer person, often we don't know exactly what our family is going to look like, or, you know, how much of that is going to be, you know, look like we have been sold to be a normal, you know, family. And when I, you know, 
married my wife and and now being part of these kids' lives for over three years, I think about how that has informed my activism, has informed all the things I remember I still have to learn. <laughs> and, you know, so I think similarly to my brother, I say like taking on that label has changed my priority somewhat, you know, and has made me kind of feel like I have to slow down a little bit more. So, you know, in terms of my work and the things I'm passionate about, all of those things are the same. And being somebody who's, a, you know, a queer identified person who's also a faith leader and, you know, very public facing, when the opportunities arise, that is a huge piece of me. And this other piece of me, I think, is unfolding. And I have a different appreciation for just the different ways that people move through the world now who have these same labels. And so, you know, um, I think the only other piece that I would add is, you know, I grew up in first in New York and then in Texas. And then when I was, you know, a missionary in my teens, I, I moved to Canada and spent the next 20 years there. And I always thought that I would still really hold on to my American citizenship, like in terms of like ideolo ide ideologically and, you know, very much grew up wearing American flag t-shirts and then, you know, don't mess with Texas kind of thing. And um, being Canadian now as well as American and having time in another country really invited me to look at what was helpful or not about aligning myself with a certain country and like what did that actually say about who i was if anything what am i actually aligning myself with if i say i am from this place and you know so i i do say that i'm canadian and american and there's different things that come with both of those places but i'm really thankful for what both of those countries have taught and continue to teach me, sometimes what to do and sometimes what not to do. Um, but they definitely have influenced my calling and the things that I do. And I'm thankful to be able to sort of lean on both of those places and learn from people, you know, in very different, they, they, they touch each other, they're very close to each other, the countries, but they're very, very different in a lot of ways. So, yeah, that's a little nutshell for me. But for the record, for those who are listening only, your shirt currently says Canada. And your, <laughs> and your bedspread is like a flannel, a flannel. Yes, I, this is not America. staged. I, ha I, do have a, I do have a moose on my, <laughs> my sweatshirt. This is not staged. Um, listen, I'm gay. I like plaid. So <laughs> this all goes together. I appreciate you naming all, all of those sort of intersections of yourself. Um, how do you think those intersections kind of guide the way that you see the world, right? You've got all these ways that your geography has changed. You've got ways that your, your family has changed, that your chosen family has changed. How does that change your your vision of, of the world around you yeah i think for me the the starkest thing i first think of in terms of the strongest is when when i when i became a canadian citizen at my citizenship ceremony you know uh i before that i had to take a test for it right and one of the things that you have to commit to and make an oath to is the six rights and responsibilities of being a Canadian citizen. And, you know, so for example, one of them is that, you know, when you're of legal age to vote, that you vote. One of them says that your responsibility is to eliminate discrimination and injustice. And I never imagined that that would be in an official document is something that you should do. Like, obviously that's something we should all be striving for, but it's not something that I could have imagined being on 
an American citizenship test um, or something that you pledged to if you were coming to America. So I think that really shifted something for me when when Canada became less about, oh, this is this is a nice place to be and I feel like my community is here. And when I read that, I was like, I'm in, you know, I'm I'm in for being in a place where somewhere along the line this got in. And yes, do people do that perfectly? No, do I? Absolutely not. But there was something that really struck me about that. And I took my citizenship really seriously in a new way that I didn't expect in terms of saying, you know, I have committed to do this as part of me living here. So it's not just about what I think is, you know, fun or right or whatever, but like to eliminate discrimination and injustice is a big ask. And so am I doing that? And am I doing that wherever I live because I've made this commitment, you know? And I think being a parent has humbled me. Um, I'd, I'd like to think of myself as an autodidact, you know, I will learn anything. And, you know, there's been so many skills I have that I'm like, Okay, I don't know how to do this, but I can figure it out. We have YouTube, we have books, we have, you know, people who are happy to talk about how to do something, so I can do that. And that's been really helpful for me in my career. Um when I my wife and I, you know, first really knew, yeah, like we're this is this is our family, this is what we're doing. I uh I downloaded maybe six audiobooks about how to be a good step parent because I was I'm like I'm gonna do this perfectly so let me start learning and I'm laughing at sort of like my naivete at uh, just the thought of that I mean I, I, my intention I think was genuine but I started reading the books and I actually got really terrified because there's a lot of really horrible examples they use as to like is this happening to you here's how to fix it right and I was like oh my gosh this can happen things I didn't even you know dream of and i think now i just realized there's no guide nobody knows what they're doing in so many ways and i have so much more appreciation for people who are caretakers not just people who are officially parents you know but people who take care of others in those sorts of roles because what it requires of you, if you if you're doing it halfway well, you know, is a is a lot. And to even care, like at that level, if you're doing it well or not, is probably a good thing. So I have learned a lot from Ash, my wife. I've learned a lot from other people who have gone through these journeys. I've obviously learned a lot from, you know, our kids in just, I think, bringing myself to the table. Not that I, not that books maybe aren't helpful or anything like that, but just there's a, a Latin phrase, and I'm sure I'm not going to say it perfectly, but it's something like esse quam videre, and it means to be rather than to seem to be. And I've always thought about that, you know, how can I just be? instead of picturing who I should be and trying to project that. And I think in this role, I have felt a lot of pressure to have a certain projection of what that should look like, meet a certain standard. Um, and it just is not, it just doesn't work that way, even though I tried to make it fit. So I think how that's impacted how I see the world is just having to be open to that. There are some things that we're never going to nail down. We can be curious, we have to care. And there's no like one, two, three, this is how to do it. And it has melted some of my judgment, I think, for 
you know, seeing people who are in different situations with the people they're taking care of and thinking, oh, I would do this, this, and this. And it's like, I don't know. So I think having to be uncomfortable with not knowing, uncomfortable with, you know, one of my favorite authors is Anne Lamont. And she says, sometimes we are just, it, it's only what we can see with our headlights on low, right? That's all we can see. And I wanna see the whole road. I wanna see the whole map. I wanna see everything. But sometimes that's all we can see. We just have that little bit. And to not try to force that, to just know I'm gonna to try to do the next thing that is hopefully loving and then the next thing. And, and I don't know what that looks like every moment and neither do other people. And to give myself grace for that is a huge hurdle. And I think realizing that I was missing some of that grace for other people too. So I think those two things, you know, my commitment to, you know, what is my commitment to any discrimination and like, how can I be okay with unknowing and not being an expert <laughs> on some things, right? Well, that was sort of cracking me up because you you talked about being uh, wanting to be perfect. And my experience in, of you is that you are someone who is um, faithfully wild, if that's a term that you are. I um, love it. Creatively um, radical, um, but not not in like a harmful space. And so the idea of you trying to be like perfect at anything, I know it would only come from love. But um but also in your in your own self description, talk about yourself being an atypical activist, right? Which is mm -hmm. which is maybe per perfect in that it's free and changing, kind of like you described, but definitely not like mm -hmm. following the chapter and manual of of you know. Here's eight steps to protest. Do it that way every time. Right. Uh, would right. you be willing to describe a little bit about like what? being an atypical activist means to you and how you live that in your world? Yeah, I don't even remember how I came about with that term, but I just remember it really clicked because I think sometimes we can easily, you know, think of a word like, like feminist, like, um, you know, uh, coworker, like blonde, do we, any word that may, you know, just we get a picture of, of who somebody is or what they're about or something like that. And, and I began to see as I began, began to be more involved in the queer community. And as I began to do more advocacy for things that I really cared about and people I really cared about. And I just kind of realized like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of seeing this through a little bit of a different lens than some of the people that I was around. And I think that lens for me was uh, more about helping people be excited and be curious about being uncomfortable. Less about like gotcha moments and less about exposing things and less um, maybe overt but I think a, basically, I think I always ask myself, how do I want to be communicated with if somebody thinks that my behavior is problematic and wants to change my heart and mind? What would I potentially be receptive to? Because I think often we can have discussions where we think and we can really craft, like this is exactly what those people over there need to learn. And this is exactly how they need to change. And these are the new words they need to know, et cetera. And we might be correct in terms of the change that needs to happen. But I think for me, I'm like, what works? What actually works? And it's not always as straightforward as that. So I think, you know, it doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion. It doesn't mean I don't have strong opinions. It do doesn't mean that I don't get fired up or draw boundaries or anything like that. It's just, I always think, how, how do I wanna be transformed? And how have people transformed me 
when I'd been closed minded, when I have been ignorant, when, you know, I have felt really scared to change something about what I believe or something that makes me feel safe or empowered and threatened, you know, and so, and, and how have other people invited me into that space? And so I think that's led me to pursue using music, using comedy, you know, bringing a lot of humor, you know, doing, doing things, I think, with a really warm approach so that folks feel like they're a part of the conversation. They're not being talked at, they're being talked with, right? And it's the difference between, you know, teaching is putting on, like you're putting, you know, if you pick, picture, like, if we're putting knowledge on top of people, but, you know, the root word of education, educe, is like to draw out. And I think having this overall recognition, especially being a person of faith, that we already are created with a sense of wanting to be oriented to what's loving, I think. It doesn't mean we listen to it and act on it. But I think we have it. We have the capability to do that. And so having an understanding that we all have that inside of us. And so how do I want to invite that out? How do I want to educate in those terms to say like, hey, I know that we're all trying to do this thing, be better people, be more loving. And here, here are some ways that that can happen that hopefully resonate in a way that doesn't cause folks to be defensive and shut off. Maybe they'll be uncomfortable, but being okay with being uncomfortable. And I think because I still have, you know, relationship with people who, um, you know, that their beliefs are really painful for me and the way they vote and act and the things that they're a part of are do not feel loving at all and so you know it leaves me with the question of these people that i love how what would i maybe i'm not the one to speak to them into this specific thing but how would i want somebody to invite out the possibility of change in them and so that's why i call it atypical i think I don't think I invented this and I don't think I'm the best at it, but I think at that time in my life, when I began to really identify with acting and creating change, this isn't something that I saw in my circles. And so I think now that I've been doing this for coming on 15 years, I've been able to find a lot of folks who have similar ethics around it and a similar heart and we don't want to go into spaces and disrupt in order to shame everybody. I think we want to trouble the waters so that more people can be free. And in that sense, I think that's where I seem to fit and groove really well. It's not the right way for everybody. And I think there are people who are called to things that are you know, maybe a lot more direct or less than what I do. But for me, this seems to be a groove that works for me and that I feel like I want to continue to to learn about and to think about and to try to really hone a way to do this that's effective, that does create change, but that doesn't leave sort of a shambles of people who feel defensive and shamed and kicked out. Well, my, my experience of you is that you are someone who takes that same sort of empathy. I, I know you um, through, through our own personal interactions, but also kind of through your, your affirming work in the world that you do with organizations and church spaces and, like people who want to put their faith into action and kind of you being someone who listens to all of the hurts that happened um, and listens to the people who inflicted some of the hurt and, and didn't know it, um, but maybe want to be in a space of not doing it in the future. 
And, and I feel mm -hmm. like you do a lot of really good heart work with people and just like holding people's hands when they sit through that awkward that you described. Mm -hmm. In order to do that though, it takes some good self care or some good wellness work, or at least to like shake it off in some sort of way. What do you do for your own personal wellness to make it possible to do this work for that long and to be able to, to kind of lead with empathy rather than with anger in those atypical acts. yeah that's a really good question it's it's funny because i think automatically when i think about wellness i picture like capital w right like and the things that we sort of assume are automatically under that like meditating and you know very soft music and you know essential oils and stuff like that i have nothing against those things but that's not the first thing that I go to. I think, I guess I would think like, to be very completely honest, the first thing I think about is my dog. Um, I am so in love with this dog. <laughs> um, another beautiful thing that my wife brought into my life is our dog and he's like sleeping very peacefully um, snoring on his bed on our bed right now. And he is just like in, in just that moment, you know, I talked earlier about how, like, I want to see beyond the headlights. I want to see the brights on, I want to see everything in the future and do a risk assessment <laughs> and make sure I know the way he doesn't care about that. He's like, I'm hungry. I want you to play with me. Um, I want to be cantankerous right now. I, I want you to take a nap with me. Like there's just, it's just like, it's, I'm not calling it simple because I think they are very complex, you know, people, not people, but I don't know, maybe they're in some ways, but, but they're complex creatures. Um, and I think it was just like the right time. Like I've always been somebody who loves dogs, but like, you know, I'm like, oh man, like this, it brings me such a sense of like, oh, okay. And I feel so disconnected from my physical self sometimes that to reach out and pet him and to ha connect in such a physical way I'm like, oh yeah, I have a body, you know? Oh, he needs to go out, he's thirsty. Am I thirsty? I should think about that. <laughs> um, so that's something that brings me, I think some like grounding and some peace. And I can really tell when I'm traveling, even though I love traveling, um, I'm like, oh man, I really miss that dude. Um, I think another thing I think of is, stories you know and i think sometimes maybe people are maybe this is me i don't know um i always think it's really aggressive when people say i don't even own a tv <laughs> or something like that i'm like good for you great you know um i'm like what well, do you own a laptop and seven streaming subscriptions um but you know i think stories i you know i've never I, I haven't found something that just like has maybe made as much of an impact on me than some of the media and some of the stories that I've consumed of just like realities I never would be able to experience in person and things that have completely shifted my whole idea about them in like a 27 minute show. Right. And then, you know, I will say this, I don't always watch things that are going to shift me. Okay. One of my favorite things is baking, like watching people bake. And so seeing this, especially if you watch like British baking, the stakes are so low and yet so high because they win a plate. Like they, they win a cake plate, a cake stand. 
we're not, this is not survivor where they're trying to trick each other for a million dollars or whatever and like steal the last piece of rice or whatever i don't even know what <laughs> survivor is but like it's people who are, do not do this for a living they have their lives and they found something that brings them joy and they're willing to spend hours and put in love and care into some beautiful thing that is going to disappear. It's going to be eaten or, you know, given away to somebody. It's it's going to go, but like the the beautiful moment of presentation and love and thoughtfulness behind it, it's just like, it's just beautiful to watch. And it's devoid of some of the, you know, especially if I really need to sort of really like, you know, shut off anxiety around the world and all the noise that's happens and everything. It's like, it's just a, a very simple, like watching people take care. And, um, you know, do I attempt anything that I watch? I did make sausage rolls um, once and it, I think it went well. I'm very proud of myself. So I'm going to say it on every recording from now on. But I think, I think more my dog and baking, I think. <laughs> I love that story so much. I love, I, um, I will a ask Ash later if the sausage rolls were successful and then I will not tell anyone. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> she said they were, as she said. So I, I hope so. I think it's I think gotta be true. Be it's gotta be yeah. true. It's gotta be true. I, I there is a rabbi, um, at, at my workspace who every Friday makes challah for the whole staff to try to show them that they're loved. And his motto is that you have to put more butter on it than you think you deserve because that's how God feels about you. <laughs> and and I like, it's, I, I'm gonna make it there someday to be able to like make it with them. But I just, I get the like leftovers on Sundays. Um, mm -hmm. And I always have to like take it home and slightly microwave it, then put on more butter, put on as much butter as God thinks I should have for the purpose of like remembering that like someone put their love into this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is such a perfect time, the holiday season of like neighbors giving you weird foods. And so this is a yeah. very timely message for everyone who has received both the stuff that's good and the stuff that you're like, why do I have this now? <laughs> uh, right. That what you're receiving is like someone's wellness that mm -hmm. they needed someone to give the like byproduct of their wellness to whether or not it yeah. contributes to ours can be up to us and our doctor about what our body shapes and sizes want to do. Right. Um, right. But I love that as a as a great reminder of of what to be up yeah. to. Um if if people want to connect with you for all of the ways that you help hold stories. Um, what should they connect with you about? What, how should they connect with you? Um, I mean, I can't recommend your awesomeness more um, if they need an excuse <laughs> to do, but what's, what's the best way for people to be in touch to learn more? Mm -hmm. So uh, my website is pretty simple. It's just my name, pamrocker.com and you can, see some of the stuff that I'm up to on there, some of the work I've done. If you're curious about working with me for having conversations about, you know, making change in your organization, in your faith community, um, in your team, that's what I love to do. Um, and so you can learn about that there. You can also, I'm on Instagram and threads at real pam rocker so just the word real and then my name um people have tried to be pam rocker that aren't me so i try to be very clear about that and yeah if you're if you're curious about any of the things that i shared just uh send me a message i think my profiles are public right now um knock on wood that <laughs> the, I, I don't have to block anybody at this point um yeah, if you're curious about anything that I'm up to, just feel free to drop me a line. And 
one of the other things that I do semi-regularly is for a literary festival called Word Fest. I interview authors and what they're up to and stuff. So that happens uh, every year in Calgary in Canada. So I can't recommend that enough in terms of, um, like I said, stories, not just not just baking, but other other stories too. Um, I love being among people who are imagining, you know, different futures. And um, there's always such a sense of like solidarity and possibility. So yeah, pamrocker.com. And, um, you know, as we think about the holidays and all the things that those, you know, that this time of year can mean, um, I think echoing you, Megan, in terms of like, you know, we might not receive um, exactly what we want. You know, we might, we might get fruitcake that we hate, or we might get this and that, but just, I think, encouraging myself and encouraging other folks, like, look for the care that that people do show around you you know the neighbor that does a couple extra squares you know squares of snow shoveling for you or you know just just some of those little things cuz i think you know the world is too big and too noisy um for us to sometimes see some of those things and i think the amount of care that does exist is is more than we know and so just being people who you know mr roger said look for the helpers you know look for that and 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 if you have the energy be somebody who does that you know those a couple extra things for maybe folks who um don't have the energy this time of year I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Pam Rocker and that you will like and subscribe and say nice things. Thank you to everybody who's been reviewing the podcast and, and putting nice words out there. Reach out to Pam if you want to send some love along uh, to Pam for all that she is up to in the world. And if you are able, consider joining Patreon or helping to support projects like these in the new years, you're going to see that the number of projects that I'm up to is going to keep expanding as we amplify and support justice makers and peace seekers and hope explorers and just continuing to have these conversations about what wellness looks like so that all will have the opportunity to be well. Thank you for listening to all of these episodes or even just this one. I really appreciate the support and the ways that you have continued to provide wellness for me through our interactions online. Take care, be kind to yourself, and know that you are beloved.